Welcome to Evidence for Faith and our series that we're doing on the road to Emmaus. So glad you're joining me today. Uh, today, the weather here is very cold. Um, it's nice to be in a nice warm studio where I'm sitting here uh, being able to record, and it's nice and toasty in here. And uh, I don't know where you're sitting. If you're in a car, you're sitting at home, or maybe you're working someplace and just have the podcast going. I do so enjoy having you with me again as we explore the Old Testament prophecies of the, the Messiah. And as we're going along with this and been looking at different lessons, and the, um, we've been numbering them as we've been going along, and if you're keeping your notebook and going along with us in the notebook, uh, you'll know that I've been covering and, and uh, counting these as we've gone along. And today, we're actually starting uh, another new book, as we get into this, and I think we're on number, let me just check here, it's number 36, uh, Prophecy 36, and this is the book of Job. Job, yes, the Old Testament book of Job, that's the one we're talking about today. And as we are going to be uh, starting here, we're also going to get into the book of Psalm today. Psalms has quite a bit. I mean, it's going to take us a long time to get through Psalms, but Job is not a whole lot here uh, for Messianic prophecies, at least major ones. Um, so our number 36 major prophecy, I'm just calling it Job, um, if you want to do it that way. Or if you want a title, you could give it a title. Um, I know that my Redeemer lives, because that's where we're going to be focusing on. I know that my Redeemer lives, and it's in the book of Job. Now, for those of you who, have not, who are not that familiar with the book of Job, uh, it's the one that not a, a lot of people read. I, I grant that. And except when Christians or anybody seems to go through suffering, they'll many times pull out this book because this is a book of suffering. And God uh, helping a guy go through suffering. And, and you see in this that suffering is not, even though we live in a world of suffering, it's not always related to somebody sinning. And too often we have this idea that if something goes wrong in our life, that God's punishing me. And that is not true because that's not biblical. In some cases, yes, it is, but not always. That is a generalization people make. I have had people who have told me when I have been extremely ill or facing a major surgery um, that, I mean, they were well intending, I'm sure, but they were little comfort to me, sort of like Job's three friends. And they were doing the same thing to Job as, they, as this person uh, are these people would do to me like hey you've got some sin you need to confess and you confess that God's going to heal you and you're going to be fine but you got some sin and that is not always the case folks sometimes it's just God's plan to have us go through suffering it's not something that he designed he doesn't want us to go through suffering suffering is something that we caused on the planet we caused it God created a perfect environment in Genesis 1 and 2 a perfect place to live we're going to end up there. You get to the end of the book of Revelation. We go back to this, a, a place where there's no tear, no death, no sorrow, no illness, no disease, um, no depression. We go back to that. That's how we were supposed to be. But we chose poorly in Genesis chapter 3. And we are the ones that brought all this chaos among the, uh, the cosmos that God created. And even Paul writes that the entire cosmos is suffering because of our choice. And so sin and death entered the picture, and illness and disease and war and murder and rape and pillaging, everything is famines. All of this has happened because of us. And it's, it's really sad that God carries the blame on this a lot of times. Somebody will be hurting or whatever, and they blame God. God, how can you do this to me? And, you know, um, it's, it's sad because we're, we brought it on ourselves. And if we live according to God's laws and stuff, and, and if we stay close with God, yes, we're still going to go through times of suffering. Even Jesus went through times of suffering, folks. And he says, hey, they, people persecuted me, and I went through suffering. You're going to be a follower of mine. You're going to have people persecuting you, and you're going to suffer too. But as it, Paul tells us in Romans 8, that suffering, God can use suffering to his advantage. And I have witnessed this many times, that God does this. Well, Job is a person who didn't do anything wrong, and he is going through suffering. And 
we see a lot of words of wisdom in this book. Some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible are found in this book. Um, we talk about them in some of the science. Uh, I think the intro to the Science in the Bible series that we did is the video series. But anyway, Job, just to give you a little insight here to help you understand this, Job uh, lived, we're not exactly sure what years he lived. Theologians have different opinions on this, but most of them generally agree that Job lived before the time of Moses and most theologians, at least that I'm aware of and the commentaries that I have and have studied in, uh, under um, different Bible scholars and stuff, they have said that Job probably predated um, Abraham. So he was before Abraham. Somewhere between Noah and Abraham is when the book of Job takes place. Um, there's a ro lot of reasons they state that. I'm not going to go into that at this point. That's not, um, not important to our lesson. If you want to know, you can always email me or... Um, send a message or something through our website, and I'd be glad to get back in touch with you. But um, Job is uh, a, a book written before the Hebrew law was put into effect, before God gave the Hebrew people the Ten Commandments. Now, that's going to be important for part of what we're about to cover here in this short little lesson we're going to have with Job. Um, and we, we don't see, as I said, a lot of uh, Messianic prophecies, major ones here. There's some minor ones, but not major ones. But there is a major prophecy of the Messiah, and it's found in Job chapter 19, and it, specifically in verses 25 and 26, we're going we're gonna to find this prophecy. And as we read this, I imagine some of you will like recognize part of this because there are hymns that use this phrase. Um, the phrase is the, what's written here. Uh, matter of fact, there is a hymn entitled, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And there are many hymns and songs and stuff that are you are that we sing and we do that are taken directly from this passage in in the book of um, Job chapter 19. So as we do this, um, and as we you will also notice, I should say state this also, not just is it in hymns, Handel, when he wrote his magnificent musical piece, um, The Messiah, Messiah, he actually also Re, uh, used this passage in in there. So you're going to see some really interesting things as we go about um, some phrases I'm sure you're going to be familiar with, even though maybe you've never read the book of Job. But as we get into this, as I say, starting at verse 25, um, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's the key thing we're going um, after here with this thing. And in if you have your Bibles open, uh, that's the key phrase we're looking at. Verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that's quoted right there. Now, the thing is, this musical phrase uh, tells us that Job, get this now, knew of his Redeemer. Now, isn't that interesting? Job knows the Redeemer. Not just, not just talking Messiah. We're talking about a role of the Messiah. Job knew his Redeemer. Wow. Now, of course, the Redeemer, and we've covered this when we were doing the Pentateuch, um, Jesus uh, is now the new high priest, and he's our mediator, uh, much superior to Moses, as it tells us also in the book of Hebrews. Um, but he is our mediator, our Redeemer, who, um, between God the Father and the fallen man, is Jesus. And so he is the Redeemer. And we just saw this also in the last lesson, Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. And so now Boaz, though, lived after the time of Moses, so he had the laws. Job is living before the time of Moses, yet he still calls um, this uh, God his redeemer. He's talking about, as it comes down to, he's talking about the Messiah. So because of the Bible, we know this redeemer is, in fact, Jesus. We, how do we know this? Where Job writes, I know that my redeemer lives in verse 25. Well, it's very simple. Take a look at what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us, there you have it right there, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So, Yes, I know that my Redeemer lives, as Job writes. Jesus came to redeem us. He is our Redeemer. You look at verse 26, we see another short phrase here. He says, I will see God. Now, that's an interesting thing because Jesus even picks up on this. 
uh, the passage tells us that Job knew that the pure in heart will see God. Now, remember, this is written before Moses gave us this, that being pure and holy, you get to see God. Way before this, Job is living, and he is telling us this. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5, records Jesus saying the exact same thing. Um, he says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Shall see God. Basically the same thing as we, Job is telling us. If you're pure and holy, and Job was a person who, there's no recorded sin of Job, even though he was human, he did sin. There's no recorded sin. So he is telling us, uh, being pure, you will see God, and Jesus reiterates the same thing. Not only that, John, the Apostle John, in his uh, first uh, epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, tells us that as Christians and stuff, um, being purified now through the blood of Jesus Christ, we get to see God. And it reads, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now get this. Because we shall see him as he is. So we get to see God. Something right now people don't get to see. Why? Because God is very, very holy. <laughs> we are definitely not. So we can't see God at this point. Um, we don't get to see him. But the day is coming. Our Redeemer when, when he redeems us, he puts his spirit inside of us. And then when we leave this life and we go into our everlasting life with Christ, we will see God. And that's the key thing here. And that's what Job's major prophecy of the Messiah is. Those who are pure in heart, those who are redeemed in the family of God will indeed see him. And that's it for the book of Job. So that was number 36. And now we go to um, the next book. And this is the book of Psalms. Psalms, oh my gosh, uh, we're going to be in Psalms for a while because this is such a massively uh, book full of uh, Messianic prophecies. Oh my gosh, there is so much in here that is quoted throughout the New Testament by the writers of the New Testament, proving that these are Messianic in form, and we're going to see this. I mean, the book of Psalms really does have a lot to say about the Messiah. It does. Now, just to give you a little little hint here, if you've never read the book of Psalms or you're only familiar with a couple of them, if you ever sit down and read Psalms, it's a beautiful book. It's a book of songs and prayers. That's what it is. And if you do a study on this, and I've had many people contact me over the years and even in Bible studies and stuff, people said, I've been studying Psalms and I'm coming across this. I know this is Messianic, but I don't understand it. Well, I'm going to try and help you walk through some of these things because some of the Psalms prophecies that we see here are a little hard to understand because what they're doing, they are, they are being fulfilled. They're songs, like I say, and prayers, but they are being fulfilled by Jesus the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, he fulfills a lot of these songs. And often what you see in the book of Psalms, unlike what we've seen with some other prophecies, we're going to see uh, in the book of Psalms, these prophecies are many times going to be what the life of the Messiah will be like. We get to see through the writers, David mostly here, but there were other people who wrote songs. And as we go through this, you're going to see events in the life of the Messiah. He actually shows us this, and he detain, details these things. He gives us certain e detailed e events taking place. And he does so, uh, and these writers do, from a human point of view. And in doing so, they describe sometimes um, Jesus as being the the uh, mediator, our intercessor, but also a lot of times it's things that take place in his life. So we're going to start this and we're going to come to our 37th major prophecy. And we're starting off in chapter 2 of Psalm. And this is a big chapter. Oh my gosh, this is, there is so many messianic prophecies in this chapter. As a matter of fact, chapter 2 of Psalms is one of the books of Psalms, one of the chapters that you will see a tremendous amount. It has so many messianic prophecies in it. So we're going to go through this sort of quickly. We're not going to get very far after this because um, we'll be out of time. But this is an amazing one. So you ready? Number 37, Psalm chapter 2, and I'm entitling this, The Son of God. The Son of God. Actually, we've already covered this a little bit when we were doing some earlier lessons. But this psalm 
um, which we're going to read in sections. I'm not going to read the whole thing straight through. I'm just going to read sections of it and go through it and explain them, make it a little simpler to follow me this way. This psalm can be divided into four sections uh, dealing with the Messiah. There's going to be, first of all, the revolt of man. Second, the response of God. Third will be the aspects of the Messiah's rule. And then the fourth part, fourth section, is submitting to the Messiah. So those are our four aspects, and we're going to talk about each one of those closely as we go through it. So let's start with the first one um, in Psalm chapter 2. In the first three verses, verses 1 through 3, and if you want to put a subtitle to this, this is called the revolt of man, the revolt of man. So, and I will read it now, and then we'll go through this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, you look at this, and you might be wondering, this is messianic? Oh, yes, it is. It's talking about a revolt against God. Well, who has revolted against God? Well, mankind has. Genesis 3, we revolted against God. But even so, as you read through the Old Testament, how many times do the people revolt against God? God tries to set them up, gives them a good king or something like this, and the people revolt. Um, or we have a bad king, they're revolting, and the next king comes up, like the kings of Israel, and they keep revolting. Revolt after revolt. They just don't want to follow God. So these kind of things. And we have the same thing today. People are revolting against God. They don't want anything to do with him, or they by uh, keep telling themselves that there is no God. They, they somewhat can believe, or think they can believe, that there is no God. Um, but the day is going to come where they're going to realize the error of their ways here. But this revolt is against God, but it's not God. Did you catch who else was mentioned here? The Anointed One. Yes, the Anointed One. In Hebrew, this is the word Meshach. Meshach. That's where we get the word Messiah. Messiah comes from this. Um, so we see Messiah, which is, um, you know, we say Messiah in English and referring to Meshach of uh, the Hebrew language. In, in the Greek, the, um, the word for anointed is Christ. So when someone says Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. Um, it's Jesus, if you're going to be really technical, it's Jesus the anointed. Or that's the word Mashiach, Messiah. So Jesus Messiah, that's what we're saying here. Now Christ is not the last name of Jesus. That's not on his address book or something like that. It's actually the Greek uh, transliteration of the Hebrew word Mashiach. And like I say, that's where we get Messiah. Now, with that knowledge right there, we see, oh my gosh, this is Messiah. So this is Messianic. I mean, it's pretty you know, black and white here that um, that's what this is. So let, let's continue, though, um, as we go through this, because I want to show you something from the book of Acts, chapter 25, I'm sorry, chapter 4. Verses 25 through 27. And um, there's a sermon going on here, um, Peter speaking. And as he's doing this, he actually is talking about this passage we just read. So Acts 4, 25 through 27, um, as, as he's um, preaching. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people. And it's talking about the rebellion. So this sermon is going on, and he is quoting the passage. Um, it starts off here, you know, talking about um, in in the book of Acts, as, as Peter's talking, uh, people plot. That's the people plot. That is actually a quote right out of this um, verse 1 of Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set them up. That's, that's verse 2. And it even talks about the anointed. Against the Lord, against his anointed. And that's also in verse 2. And so we see this is actually, Peter is using that passage to show 
that, hey, the person you crucified, that you revolting against, that you have the Gentiles even helping you in crucifying and killing this, this guy, this was the Messiah. He was the anointed. That's what it's saying. And Peter even says, against his anointed. So under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Peter and John, who are at this point um, in Acts 4, are proclaiming this passage in Psalm 2 to be referring to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The Messiah was mocked. This is talking about someone mocking, scoffing by the Gentiles, and that's exactly what happened with Jesus. He was mocked and scoffed at by the Gentiles. Um, you have uh, Herod, of course, the Romans under um, Pontius Pilate and stuff, and the people of Israel themselves. So that's the first part of this. Uh, the second uh, subpart of um, Psalm 2, this 37th prophecy we're doing, um, is verses 4 through 6. So 4, 5, and 6, and the subtitle for this would be called The Response of God. Now we have the Messiah being you know, mocked, the revolt of man. Let's listen to what God's response is going to be. So, picking up in verse 4 and going through 6 of Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, in here we read God's, um, God's response, three responses actually, to men who rebel and who mock him. In verse 4 he says, God laughs and scoffs at him. It is so pitiful today for me to watch people who, who curse God, make fun of God, they, they insult God, etc., etc., and like, you think this is hurting him? I mean, he, he's got to be laughing at us. Like, you, you guys, puny man, you think you can, you can really hurt me in any way like this? Sticks and stones with God? I mean, this is ridiculous. But that's verse 4. God laughs and scoffs at him. That's what we see here. Verse 5, what do we see happening? God disciplines them here. In verse 5, um, they're terrified now by his wrath. And in verse 6, what happens? God installs the Messiah in Jerusalem. So when Jesus returns, this is a future part of the prophecy. So not all this prophecy has been fulfilled yet, but part of it has. And when the Messiah returns, he will set up in Jerusalem and be anointed there. The third subtopic that we see in this passage, uh, Psalm 2, are verses 7, 8, and 9. And the subtitle for this one is Aspects of the Messiah's Rule. So Aspects of the Messiah's Rule. So let's read this one. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with an iron rod and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So verse 7, as we see, the, as this part here starts off, it's all about the position of God's son. God actually declares here, since this is talking about the Messiah, Remember, this psalm is about who the Messiah is. That he's the anointed one, Meshach, Christ. Who is he? The Son of God. And we see right here. And this is where um, the, the Jewish people understood that when the Messiah comes, he would be the Son of God. That the Messiah is God. And that's where they get this. It's right out of Psalm 2. Because it's talking about the Messiah, the anointed one, and then it talks about Jesus, it says, God says, you are my son. So, and, and we see this picked up so many times in the New Testament. Matthew 3, 17. Um, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, verse 5. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Acts 13, verses 32 and 33. You are my son. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. You are my son. I will be his father. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. You are my son. The Jews expected that the Messiah, the anointed, coming, would be the Son of God. And this is where they get that. So this is a key prophecy. Oh my gosh, this is a major one. But we're not done with this, this section here, this subtopic of aspects of the Messiah's rule. We come to verse 8. This, is, this was talking about that I will make your, the nations your heritage and the end of the earth your possession. So this is going to be the possessions of Christ. Here God the Father bestows on his anointed one the inheritance of the world. 
the inheritance included the Gentile world. Because it's just not the Jewish world, it's the Gentile world. All this is fulfilled to a degree right now, but will be ultimately fulfilled when Jesus returns, when the Messiah returns. Because remember, as the Messiah came the first time, he came as the suffering Messiah. He came to take away the sins of the world. He came to give us truth, to die and offer us grace and mercy. But when he comes again, he's going to be a little bit different in his attitude because when he comes again, he's going to come with, um, with a lot of power and being a victorious warrior judge. Mm -hmm. um, so that part of this is a future event. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul, in writing to the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he, he actually gets into this part of this uh, in Psalm 2 here. He's talking about it. He says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. A day is going to come where everybody is going to bow to Jesus. It's going to happen. Everybody who has ever lived is going to bow to Jesus. People who defy him right now and say you didn't exist. People who defy him now and say you were just an ordinary person. People who will say you were just um, uh, maybe a great teacher, but you were never, ever the Messiah. They will bow their knees and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's a future event. It's coming. So you have a choice. You want to bow now? Make him your Lord, accept him, or you're going to be forced to later on. Interesting. And let me just, for a moment, digress here a bit. Christian, beloved people, when was the last time you ever bowed to God? When was the last time, say, you're in prayer and you're talking to him, acknowledging his presence around you because God, his spirit, is all around? But when was the last time you ever actually bowed down? We have a tendency, particularly in the Protestant uh, denominations, that we pray always standing up. We sing songs often that we bow down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, or we bow down to worship and, and stuff. We sing that. What always puzzles me and actually irritates me a little bit, we sing these choruses about bowing down and worshiping Jesus, and we do it standing up. Why? Why do we do that? I just challenge you. Take a moment sometime. Get on your knees. Or as um, some people would do, lay down before him. Acknowledge his presence. He's ever present. He's there. And acknowledge how great he is. And just bow down and worship him. Mm -hmm. We're all going to do it later on another time, probably many times as Christians, because we know who he is, and we should be doing it. But there's another part, verse 9. We haven't got to that in this aspect. It says, you shall break them with the a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is definitely having to do with the power of the Messiah's rule. Um, this is pretty harsh. Obviously, this is not the suffering Messiah. This is when Jesus comes again. It will be fully fulfilled when he comes and he will be the victorious warrior judge king. Um, now, there are some theologians, and you can pick up some commentaries. I have some sitting right behind me here in the studio that say that this part of the prophecy only deals with David. Well, I have a tendency to disagree with this. Um, and they say that because, because Jesus is a God of love and peace. And the way that a lot of the people today... Uh, Christians and even non-Christians picture Jesus as, you know, some guy with long hair walking around passing out daisies to people and wearing some multicolored tie-dyes or something and just talking on peace and love. That's the way that they see Jesus. Well, they're confusing what the suffering Messiah is. Yes, Jesus is love. Jesus does offer peace. But the thing is, that's why he came the first time is to give us grace and mercy. And yet we're abusing that, that gift so much. We, we lose track of who Jesus really is. Jesus is holy God. He is a holy God. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. Because he is holy, he's perfect. He is pure. He is the standard of truth. And we just sort of get this out of our minds about Jesus. And unfortunately, a lot of people just don't see this. I remember when I taught uh, public high school and having a discussion 
uh, twice in, in classes with people where they're saying the impression of Jesus that they had was, well, he's just like the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And, and I just want to go up and hug him and kiss him and, and stuff like this. And I'm like, do you understand you're talking about somebody who's so so perfect and holy that when you really see him, you're not going to go run up for a hug. You're going to be falling on your face to the floor because you're going to see how holy he is. And when he comes back, it's going to be too late for the suffering Messiah here, and he's going to come back with a sword. He came the first time as the Lamb of God. He's coming back as a warrior judge king, spewing out justice. And that's who's going to come. That's what we're going to see. And, and it says that he's going to uh, break them with an, a rod of iron and dash them to pieces. This is not the, the picture we have of the suffering Messiah Jesus that came that's recorded in the four Gospels. This is, though, the same Jesus. And when he comes back, he's offering us now a chance to join him, to worship him, to be a part of his family, to let him be our, our sacrifice, that his blood came to, to take away our sins. He's giving us that option now. But if those who don't accept this, oh my gosh, what's coming for you? Revelation tells about it. Revelation 12, verse 5, a son who will rule with an iron scepter. Revelation 19, 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Even Revelation chapter 2, as this book, book sort of opens up, verses 26 and 27, he will rule them with an iron scepter. So, of course, these passages are dealing with the second coming of the Messiah. But don't be misled. That Messiah is still Jesus. He's the same one, and he will dash his enemies. Please, I implore you, don't be an enemy of the Messiah. I mean, we all were at one point, even Christians, we were all enemies of God. But through Jesus Christ, we now have peace with God through his sacrifice. The only difference between us and them and non-Christians and stuff who will, are under still the curse and stuff, is that our sins have been forgiven and God has put his Holy Spirit inside of us and he's slowly sanctifying us and changing us to be a new creation. That's what's going on. That's why we're different. It's not that I'm a better person than anybody else. No, I, am, I still mess up and do things wrong. The thing is, I'm forgiven. And I'm so thankful for God for doing this. Which takes us then to the fourth part of this, this passage. And this is verses 11 and 12. And I'm, the subtitle for this one is Submit to the Messiah. And it reads, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in your way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now notice, this is again, don't forget, this is talking about the same Jesus that's mentioned in the four Gospels, the suffering Messiah, but here he's not the suffering Messiah. This, again, is talking primarily about future events. And it says to kiss the sun. By the way, to kiss the sun, you know what this is talking about? It's not being romantic. What it means is to submit, to surrender fully. The Hebrew meaning of this passage here, of this phrase, is having to do with submission. You see, at the time David wrote this, one thing that was very common in the ancient world, when a king defeated another king, they would force that king many times to either kiss the hand or more often, they had to kiss the feet of the victorious. So the king of the fallen country would bow down to the victorious king and kiss his feet as a sign of submission. Actually, if you want to really get technical into this, this is where we start to get the word, the meaning, literal meaning of what the word worship is. Um, but that's for another lesson. The whole point is we too must submit to the, our King, Jesus the Messiah. And Christians, speaking to, to all of us here, we should do this every day of our life, every aspect of our life. Too many times we have rooms in our house. When I say house, I'm not talking about the house we live in, I'm talking about our body. In our mind, we have certain rooms and stuff, places where we go for entertainment, things that we do for rest, for recreation. All of those we need to offer to Jesus. We shouldn't have a room in our house that say, God, you can go into the kitchen. You can see what I eat. God, you can go into the uh, living room. Ooh, some people would have a problem with that. And watch what I, I read or I, I watch on uh, the television. Or, uh, Lord, you can't go in my computer room. 
It's just, you're not allowed in there. You know, sometimes it's like that. We're supposed to give them all. I surrender all, that beautiful hymn. That's what that's talking about. Well, that takes us to the end of that one. So, and we're going to go now. We're going to do one more psalm here before we're done. And this will be number 38. And 38, it's going to be Psalm chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Just two, uh, two verses here. And then we'll be, um, we'll be done with this one because we're about out of time here. But number 38, Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10. And I'm titling this one, The Resurrection. The Resurrection. Actually, we've already talked about this in previous lessons, about this um, Psalm 16. But now that we're here, let's go a little bit deeper into it. This psalm was first intended, it, it does have a, pair, a, um, a paired meaning. Many of the psalms will have paired meanings with the life of David. This is one of them. Um, David died. Well, we get that. But David didn't get resurrected. Jesus does. So this psalm was first intended to refer to the King David, but it pertains really, when you read the whole thing, it's definitely not David. It's got to be the Messiah. And it reads, um, Therefore my heart is glad. Let me skip a, few, a little bit here, and it says, You will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. So, therefore my heart is glad. Well, you can see that easily fits, David. The second part here, not abandon me to the grave, or let your Holy One see decay. We know that David decayed. His body's gone. Um, so this is specifically a prophecy that the Messiah would be in the tomb. He would die. He's going to be in a grave. Who do you put in a grave? Put dead people in a grave. He, he does die. That's there. But he's not in the tomb long enough um, that he just stays there like David did and just decays away. No. Um, he's going to be there a short time. He will not see decay. And as we've already talked about that, um, back with the book of Leviticus and, and dealing with uh, yeast and decay and stuff, and that prophecy. But he would be in the tomb long enough to assure the people that he was dead. That's, that's a key thing. Um, he would go to the grave, no question about it. That's why we celebrated Easter. And the Hebrew text here is the term for grave is Sheol. Um, that's another sort of synonym there. Um, to the New Testament is Hades. There's different things here. We're not going to get into the theology of all this. It's not what the, pro, uh, the purpose of this study is. Um, though the exact time factor of the Messiah's dwelling here and stuff is not really known. We're not going to get into this. Just saying the Messiah does die. He is buried. He will go into the grave, yet the grave has no power over him. He does not stay there. He is the master over death, over Shoal, over Hades. He is master over all of this. No power can equal the Messiah. He is Lord of all. And you know, there's another fascinating thing. I mean, this is the prophecy about the Messiah, as we've already talked about. The Messiah is going to be resurrected. Here it is. It's right here. And the thing is, Peter uses this exact same passage when he is preaching in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to see Paul uses the same passage again. Let me just read for you Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 32, and see how this pertains. This is Peter speaking at Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and the signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosening the pangs of death, because it is not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not, let, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, may I say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, that both uh, 
that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. What a sermon. Pretty cool, huh? That's his sermon. And he, you can see he's actually quoting right out of this, this passage here in Psalm 16. And Paul, we're not, we're not done. One more little thing here. Paul, in Acts number th- or chapter 13, uh, verses 34 through 37, he gets in on this too. And he writes, as, And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, for he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generations, fell asleep and was laid with his father and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Corruption is talking about the decay, as we talked about in Leviticus with yeast. It has to do with the decay process. The Messiah would not see decay. Why? Because he is alive today. How cool is that? Take a take assurance in that. Oh my gosh, this is just so cool. And this is just the beginning of, of the book of Psalm. We have quite a few pages of material we'll be going through as we continue in this study. And I thank you so much for joining me today as we've gone through this. And when we get back together, we'll be hitting some more of these awesome prophecies, messianic prophecies dealing with with the Messiah and showing how Jesus fulfilled them, proving that he is the Messiah God, that he is totally God, he is alive, he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he deserves all honor, glory, power, and praise, and in his name only can we be saved. So until we meet again, I want you to take care, God bless, and enjoy uh, reading and studying your Bible. Take care. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that content, you can find more like it on our channel and on our website. You can also book us and get the live experience, which in my opinion is even better. But who knows, I'm a little biased. You can also help us keep this content free by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel or our other social links. You can also help support this ministry by donating online through our website or in the link down in the description. And on that note, may the Lord be with you and we'll see you on the next video.